And now let me welcome on to the show Belmont head coach Casey Alexander. Casey, what's going on, man? Thanks for being here. Uh, we're all good. Thanks for having me. So before we get started on the actual team preview, I do want to ask you a little bit about the Battle of the Boulevard. I was able to make it down about six years ago to a game. Uh, no one knows this rivalry better than you. You played in the days when there were 16,000 people showing up to Vanderbilt's gym for an NAIA rivalry game. You've coached both sides. What makes this game and this rivalry so special? Well, it's definitely a fun time, fun game for everybody that plays in it and follows either team. You know, I think, you know, one thing that sticks out the most is just the proximity of the two schools, literally on the same street, two miles apart. Uh, it was just a long history of playing each other. You know, as you mentioned, back to the NAI days where both teams were perennial top 10 teams and playing for conference championships every year with two Hall of Fame coaches and Don Meyer and Rick Bird, uh, and then enjoyed, you know, a tenure together in the A Sun where things were very similar uh, until Belmont left for the OVC in 2012. And the rivalry's changed a little bit since then, but uh, in a sense that we play in November and December now, it's not, you know, there are no conference standings on the line, but meaningful game for everybody. I think the programs are very similar. The schools are very similar. The kind of people we want in the program is very similar. And all those things combined make for a fun time. Yeah, it's one of the hidden gems that makes college basketball so special. So let's talk about this year's team. I think you might be the most experienced team in the country. I don't have any stats to back that up. I'm just going to go with it. Uh, you bring back everybody from a 26 and 14, including two guys that are going to be four year starters for you and Nick Wazinski and Grayson Murphy. Do you even need to show up for the first couple of weeks of practice at this point? Doesn't the team just kind of run itself? Well, they don't think I do. I can assure you that. <laughs> uh, you know what? But it's a nice luxury. It's, uh, you know, it just kind of fell into place this way. Nothing that we can do to prepare for seasons like this where we have so much experience returning, um, you know, but really fortunate to have it. And we, we, get, we do have 97 percent of our scoring and our minutes back from last year's team. Uh, you mentioned those two guys, uh, you know, a point guard and a five man that are as accomplished as they are. Uh, pretty remarkable players and careers already. Uh, we have five fifth year seniors on the roster, all of which are in graduate school, uh, all of which could come back for a sixth COVID year. So um, I don't think they will, but they could. I think you might have a roster that's older than the Cleveland Cavaliers roster at this point. Um, <laughs> so talk to me a little bit about how that process works as a coach, right? Normally for people that have, have never played, like the first couple of weeks of practice, you're installing offenses, you're installing defenses, you're, you're doing conditioning. I'm assuming you, if you have guys that are that old, they're coming into practice in shape. I'm assuming that if you have guys that have played for two, three, four years that have started for as long as these guys have, they probably know what your offense is by now. So what, what, what kind of benefit does that provide you at the start of the season with people that already kind of had that base knowledge? Yeah, it's huge. You know, we, we've honestly had to back off a little bit this summer, even though we had a really productive time, we, you know, we kept things really simple. We just did a lot of five on five, a lot of playing, you know, there's not a lot of offense or defense to insert, uh, certainly, you know, end of the game situations, things like that. You know, our players are much farther along than in a normal year. So I'm trying to find ways to keep it fresh. Uh, you know, these guys are really mature. I think that's one one really important part of this puzzle is that not only are they old, but they're mature. They're really good leaders. Um, they're very serious about our team being good and uh, handling that in the appropriate way. And so it's making for a fun season. You know, we've got work left to do. I mean, as, as experienced as we are and as as high as the expectations are, you know, we, we haven't played in the postseason in two years. Uh, and so um, there's plenty left out there for us to prove. One of those years was COVID and we were, we should have played, but, uh, but we haven't. How much of a, a bitter taste does, does the way the last season ended kind of leave in your mouth? Like, I'm sure that you, when you have guys like Grace and I mentioned him and Nick, those guys want to get to the back to the tournament, right? How much has that been a motivating factor? How much has that been a topic of discussion? Um, what, what has the off season been like? Yeah, these those those seniors that you mentioned, they're 83 and 17 in the last three years. You know, that's a high, that's a high clip with three regular season championships and two NCAA tournaments, uh, one of which, as we said, was COVID and didn't get played. But so they've they've accomplished a lot. But when you think about not being in the postseason and having those games, um, there's still a lot out there for us to play for a lot out there that these guys want to experience again and. And um, and that's their motivation every day. I mean, I, I sense uh, you know, you could you could have a season like this where there's complacency or, you know, you take things for granted. Um, but I, I sense a much greater desire um, to reach our peak level of performance, reach our potential than than we've had since I've been here. And so that's really encouraging for me. It, it takes a lot of the work out of the coaching staff's hands when when the players are that motivated and our leadership is that good. 
I feel like that is what the next step for this program is, right? You've pretty much done everything else. You've won about a million conference titles. Um, you are one of the uh, the best mid-major programs in college basketball. You know, we talk about how experienced you are and how you're always bringing good players back. We could say that basically every single year. You've put guys in the NBA. Ian Clark had a long career. Uh, Dylan Windler was a first-round pick. And I think he's actually playing with Cleveland. Funny, I made that joke earlier. But um, the next step is probably that that long tournament run, right? You guys just haven't gotten lucky enough to kind of get the right draws or whatever it is to, to make that run where that I feel like that's where some of these mid-major teams really get that name recognition when they're in the, the second weekend of that tournament, darling, that everybody's talking about, right? Yeah, you're exactly right. And, and we talk a lot about that, uh, not to put any undue pressure. I mean, winning tournament games is really hard for, for teams uh, coming from any league. It's just hard to win an NCAA tournament. But those are the doors that we have to knock down uh, in order to continue to grow the program. You know, And, and if you put yourself there uh, routinely enough, it'll happen. And uh, I fully expect that it will. I don't know if that's this year or some year down the road, but um, – but we're excited about those possibilities. I mean, the Belmont University, I mean, we've had 20 straight years of record enrollment. Nashville is one of the best cities on the planet. We've got great facilities here. You know, we've got a winning tradition. So there, there truly is a lot still out there for this program to accomplish. All right. So let's talk about your players a little bit. Um, you know, Nick Wazinski, he's such a throwback. I love watching this kid play. It reminds me a little bit, actually, of the Purdue teams back when they had Isaac Haas, the five, and then four guys around him that just seemingly could not miss an open three. Um, so how, how useful is he as a five? What kind of uh, fun things can you do trying to scheme ways to get him involved in the post? And, and is it, is it nice being able to have a guy where you can just throw the ball to him with his back to the basket and know you're probably going to get a bucket or get a foul? Yeah, absolutely. First of all, I played that 2019 Purdue team and they were unbelievable. So that's uh that's flashback nightmares right there for those <laughs> that group with Edwards and those guys. But, uh, you know, Moose, as we call him is, uh, is such a unique player and, um, you know, for us, he's just been incredible for, for the success of our offense. I mean, a guy that um, is dominant down in the low post. I mean, as you mentioned, a throwback, he catches it great with both hands. He scores it with both hands over either shoulder. Um, he's got a high assist, uh, you know, a nice assist turnover ratio, which is uncommon for post players. So uh, even though we shoot a lot of threes, we've actually made more threes than any team in the country since we've been Division One. You know, our low post guy, our five man is the most important part of our offense. And he he wears that hat really well. So I saw you put out a tweet this morning. Grayson Murphy. I'm just going to read this off. Grayson Murphy has won three Ohio Valley Conference titles. He's been first team all league twice. He's been defensive player of the year twice. He's been a mid-major All-American twice. And he's the only player in Division I basketball the last three years with more than 900 points, more than 600 rebounds, more than 500 assists, and more than 200 steals. So the floor is yours. Go ahead. Brag on him. What, what do you got to tell the people about him? <laughs> Throw all the numbers out the window. And he's the, he's the most competitive, best, just flat out winner that I've ever been around in the game. Uh, he finds a way to get it done. And so, um, and naturally those numbers have a lot to do with it, but, um, you know, that's, that's a self-made thing right there. And, um, he's a guy that you want on your team. It doesn't matter what, you know, if it, what day of practice it is, whether it's two on two, four on four, five on five, uh, he's, he's built that way. And, um, you know, he's, he's gives us great comfort. You know, he's, his numbers speak for themselves. I mean, he's a point guard. He's led our team in rebounding the last two seasons at almost 10 a game. Uh, you know, and uh, so that speaks to his competitiveness and just what kind of leader he is for our team. And, and again, I think the best is yet to come. He's had a great off season. So it, how nice is it to be able to kind of have those bookends be as veteran as those guys are? You know, you got your point guard and your five man. Both of them are going to be for your starters. Is that it's got to be a lot of comfort in that, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And again, nothing we can really do to prepare for it. Uh, they both. You know, Moose wasn't ready his freshman year and he redshirted. So that's why he's in his fifth year. Grayson played a little bit, but he had an injury and ended up getting a medical red shirt. So um, to have those two guys still around, Grayson's going to set the all time OVC and OVC steals and assist record this season if he has just a mediocre year. So uh, two highly accomplished players. I think that's that's the beauty of it. Not just experience, but guys that have accomplished a lot already and uh, and know what it takes to win games and, and be the best they can be for their team. Luke Smith, Ben Shepard, Caleb Hollander, those are the guys that round out your starting five. They're all upperclassmen. They're all veterans. They all know exactly what you want at this point, I'm assuming. So how valuable is it to kind of have uh, the guys surrounding your stars that are veterans that know exactly what you want out of them? Yeah, tremendously important. You know, and I think it's, uh, you know, because even as good as Grayson and Moose are, you know, we don't, 
everything doesn't begin and end with them, you know, necessarily. I think we have really good balance across our lineup. I think we have good depth. Uh, you know, Luke Smith's a guy that can play 40 minutes. Um, you know, he could be an all-conference player. There's no doubt about it. Ben Shepard's our best defender. He could be, be an all-conference player, in my opinion. Um, you know, so we have more than just those two pieces. And so you put it all together and it makes for a lot of potential. Potential is dangerous, as we all know. Yeah, you have a lot of guys that are willing to accept a role when they could put up bigger numbers. Like if they were playing at another program, you probably have guys that are first team all league players averaging 18, 19 points, whatever it is, but they're willing to accept that role, right? That, that as much as anything, role acceptance is is as important as it can get on a basketball team. Yeah, hundred percent, you know, and, and let's be fair. I mean, we have guys on our team that wish they were playing more and probably think they should be. And, and I don't know what I'm doing. Maybe, uh, you know, that's, the, that goes along with any team, but uh, it's been the strength of this program for a long time that the culture is such that guys love being in the program. And, um, you know, our transfer numbers, numbers reflect that. We've had four undergraduate transfers leave Belmont in the last 17 years. That's it, four. And, uh, you know, and not, obviously not all those guys got the playing experience they want, but, but everybody loves being on a winning team. I think we work really hard to give them a great experience. And that's where that ability to buy into the greater good is so important that you mentioned. So let's talk about these two sophomores that you got. Evan Bronze, uh, he's probably going to find it a little tough to get minutes behind Big Nick, but Jacoby Wood is the guy that I'm really interested in. It seems like he has all the makings and being that next kind of uh, Belmont star, four-year starter, or whatever it is. So uh, he averaged 11 points as a freshman. He's a big-time slasher. What are, you, what are you seeing out of him this summer, and where do you think he can improve this year? Yeah, I agree. He get, he's a dynamic player with a ball in his hands, you know, and he gives us a dimension that we haven't had here in quite some time. Uh, in my opinion. And again, and like you said, I mean, he's another guy. I mean, he could be a starter for this team. He has all conference potential, uh, but he's had to really settle into a role. I mean, he's playing behind two fifth year senior guards that are both really good and the captains of our team. Uh, so he's having to buy his time just a little bit. But, uh, you know, like all freshmen last year, he and Evan uh, and Frank Jackie Besick, our other guy who was in that class, you know, there was it was such an unusual year. They had no summer. They had no preseason. You know, they had to learn on the fly. And so they are, you know, in a much different place, Jacoby especially, than he was this time last year, just from confidence and understanding and and um, and about how it all works. So who else have you been impressed by? Who's had a big summer? Who's going to come in this season and be someone where we kind of say, oh, all right, I didn't know about him, wasn't paying attention to him last year? Ben Shepard had the best summer of anybody on our team. Uh, and um, it wasn't a surprise necessarily, but just to see his confidence to continue to grow is – is exciting for us in our future because we're going to need it when we do lose these seniors. Uh, you know, we have two freshmen that I think are really good players. And uh, I think we're lucky in a way because they were COVID signees guys that, you know, we didn't even get out and see uh, in person and so forth, but they, they have great potential and the future is bright uh, for them here as well. You know, they're in a tough position uh, joining a team with so much experience. It's going to be difficult for them to crack the lineup and, and play the role that they could play. But, um, but again, I, I mentioned a balance all the way across the lineup, but I think we have literally 14 guys I could put in the game and feel comfortable with. So this is going to be the last year that your program's in the OVC. You're headed to Missouri Valley next season. Uh, I don't know how much you've been able to watch the other Valley over the years, but I mean, it's giving Creighton a shot to become kind of a power conference program, which Utah State's a power conference program. Loyola is probably technically still a mid-major, but I mean, they're making final fours or making runs to the, they're upsetting number one seeds. Um, that's a league that kind of really shoots uh, mid-major programs kind of to that next tier. Is that something that you're looking for out of Belmont? And um, are you excited to kind of get to that league and, and see what it's all about? Yeah, 100 percent, you know, and the OVC has been great for Belmont, but uh, but it's clear that over – the course of time, history shows that uh, the Missouri Valley is, um, as you mentioned, it's it's just from top to bottom. Um, it has programs in that league that are built for success, that have the resources they need, that have the expectations to be good. Uh, and those are the kind of programs that we want to be affiliated with. You know, they've had six different teams in the 2000s that have gone to the Sweet 16, uh, two in the Final Four, which Wichita State, when they were in the league, was a number one seed, 12 and one in the last 13 first round games in the NCAA tournament. I mean, there's no league that can come close to that number. I feel confident in saying, and so uh, absolutely we'll have to get better. Uh, no doubt about it. We'll have to get better. We'll have to elevate what we're doing around here. We're prepared to do it. Belmont has the resources necessary. They understand what this move is going to mean. But um, uh, as I've said before, I think it will be a total win for Belmont to be in the Missouri Valley. And I think we can make that league even better. Well, good luck taking on sister Jane and good luck this season, Casey. Thanks for being here. It's been my pleasure. Thanks.
Awesome. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. You bet. Yeah. Thanks for doing it. I got uh, I got Rick Bird here in 30 minutes. Any messages oh, yeah? to pass along? Nice. I don't know. I'm surprised he he knows how to zoom. He's he's probably <laughs> out of practice. Make sure he gets to his tea time. That's all I can say. All right, I'll pass that message on. <laughs> all right, yeah. thanks, man. Before we move on, let me tell you guys a little bit about our partners over at Bet River Sportsbook. If you haven't signed up for Bet Rivers yet, now is the time because they are offering a $250 match bonus for your first deposit. But what sets them apart is that they require just one playthrough to turn your bonus into cash money. With their rush pay instant approval, withdrawing your winnings is safer, it's more secure, and it's more reliable. Now that basketball season is tipping off, get in on the action at betrivers.com today or by downloading the BetRivers iOS app. You must be 21 years or older. If you have a gambling problem, call 1-800-GAMBLER. And while I got you here, let's talk about the Field of 68 Media Network, where college basketball matters most all year round. This is a digital media and podcast network that we've been building over the course of the last year. We have shows hosted by some of your favorite players covering the program that they love the most. AJ Guyton hosts the House of Hoosier. Eric Devendorf covers Syracuse on the scorer's table. Dan Dickow hosts the Gonzaga Bulldog broadcast. We have Florida's Patrick Young and Duke's Andre Dawkins, and North Carolina's Shimon Williams, and Michigan's Stu Douglas, and Illinois' Deion Thomas. The list goes on and on and on. We have more than 30 shows right now. So hit the links below and check them all out. And while you're at it, make sure that you go check out the Field of 12 Media Network, your home for college football. That was Belmont head coach Casey Alexander. And now let me welcome onto the show Belmont coaching legend Rick Bird. Rick, thanks for being here, man. How you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. So before we get started on this year's team, I do want to ask you a little bit about the Battle of the Boulevard. I was lucky enough to head to a game about eight years ago down there. Uh, This is a rivalry where you were able to put 16,000 people in Vanderbilt's gym one year when uh, when you guys were both in AI school. So what is it that makes it so special to me? It's one of the uh, the little hidden gems that makes college basketball such a fun and interesting sport. I think you're right. And I think when we were both a small college instead of Division one. I'd say it was the biggest rivalry. And uh, not only did we pack Vandy's Memorial Gym, but but our gyms, game in and game out, were totally full, small gyms, 3,000, 2,400-seat gyms, not arenas, uh, with people standing all over the court. Uh, Both teams were really good NAIA programs, top five in the country. And um, we upset them in 1989, and that sort of prompted the – the talk about the game in 1990 moved our home game to Vandy and uh, uh, the fire marshal had to close the place down. Yeah. It's pretty wild to think about that for a couple of NAIA schools. I, I, I do want to ask you, so you were there when you kind of made this tra- transition to the division one level, how difficult was that? Because it's not often that you see these teams that are really good kind of at the D two and D three levels when they make that jump, continue that level of success. Well, it was, And we went from NAIA, which was really unusual, still is for that matter, to go straight from NAIA to Division I. Um, It was was hard. It was, uh, you know, when you can't go to the tournament for four or five years in any way possible, then all you're going to be able to recruit are pretty much is marginal Division I players. And most coaches will tell you, you don't win a lot of games with marginal Division I players. And, and, um, but, we felt like we needed to build it slowly. We needed to, we felt like we needed to do it through high schools and have four year players or five year players. Uh, so uh, we had, we had some uh, bumps along the road, uh, but we had a really good year at 14 and 13, thought we were turning the corner. And the next thing you know, we're seven and 21 and we backed up and, uh, uh, but we got in the league, uh, the Atlantic sun, uh, and and built the Curb Event Center, which which gave us a real Division One look, and um, and uh, we were able to compete in that league pretty quickly. And uh, so it was difficult, but you know, Rob, in some ways, it, coaching was almost more fun uh, because you were just trying to win, you weren't trying not to lose, and there really is a different mentality about that. And we were just trying to build the program. And every time we would get a, a big win, it was it was a lot of fun. 
Uh, and so I wouldn't want to do it forever, but uh, as long as you're headed in the right trajectory, it was, uh, uh, it was in some ways more fun. So you mentioned how you kind of built this program on four or five year players. That's basically what it still is right now. This year's team brings back all of the starters from last year, basically everybody off of last year's roster with two fifth year seniors that have been four year starters that are kind of the anchors of this team in Nick Mazinski and Grayson Murphy. What is it about that, ex- that experience level and, and, and kind of those guys that are uh, continuity in the program? What, what makes that so important in building a basketball team? Well, I think for, for schools like Belmont, they're trying to, trying to beat and some sometimes now expected to beat teams in the SEC or the ACC or the Big Ten. Um, it's the difference maker is uh, to have that kind of experience, along with recruiting the kind of kids that um, intangibly are very good, that, that understand how to play the game, that knows how to make the extra pass, that uh, feed the post well, that, uh, that know the scouting report. It, it, and all those things together – along with experience, uh, gives gives a, a school like Belmont a chance to beat those folks. Right. So uh, let's talk about Nick Wazinski and let's talk about Grayson Murphy. Um, they're, they're coming back from a team that went 26-4 last year, right? And, and normally for people that don't know, the first couple of week of, weeks of practice for a college basketball team, you're putting in offenses and you're putting in defenses and you're getting conditioning going. If you have guys that are that old, I'm assuming they come in in shape. If you have guys that have been there and starters for four years, I'm assuming they probably know uh, what Casey wants to do. So what is he doing these first couple of weeks? Can he just take the first couple of weeks of practice off? Is he, what's he doing? Got a couple of tea times going? <laughs> no, I might have, if I was coaching the team, but Casey's <laughs> not going to play golf. Uh, I, you know, I think that they, they went back, I think in the summer, and this is me talking to Casey. I think they, I think they did a lot of team stuff, uh, and uh, you know their 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 offensive motions, and uh, so I, I think it was a lot of five on five. I think as they've started back with individual workouts and now into practice, uh, it's been it, it was a little bit more about skill work, shooting, and that sort of thing. Uh, but you're right, it it. Um, when you have an ex- a real experienced team, it can be a little bit of a challenge uh, to uh, keep them fresh. Uh, and uh, but uh, at the same time, uh, they're going to be ready to play early, and that's going to be important for this team because they're going to be good. And if for some reason they were to get knocked off again in the conference tournament, then they're going to need to have some good wins early in the year for their resume. So when you think about Belmont, at least when I think about Belmont, typically I'm thinking of just great guards and great perimeter players, whether it's Ian Clark and Dylan Windler. Just over the year, you have always had great guards. This year's team is built around a big guy in Moose. So uh, is one, is it weird seeing a Belmont team that has just a great standout five man? And two, what, what, what kind of role do you think he's going to end up playing um, on this year's team if they're going to make a big run? Well, you know, I might uh... – I might disagree with you a little bit because we've been four out one in for a long time and we had an NAI player of the year was our five man. And we had maybe at least two different guys lead the country in field goal percentage and Adam Mark uh, and Evan Brad's uh, inside, even though Evan was a little bit atypical five man. Uh, But we've always gone to those guys. And if we don't have a guy that can score in there, you might as well not think about running four out one in. So I think, I think the success of our big guys have helped the guys you mentioned, Ian Clark, Grayson Murphy now, uh, Dylan Windler, to be successful because you got to pick and choose whether you're going to help on the big guy or you're going to go guard the guys outside. But I think the reason we've had good guards is because I think kids see the, that we shoot a lot of threes, that we play fast tempo, uh, that we play a game that's fun to play, and they're going to get their opportunity to do the things they do well. We valued all have always valued guys with good skills, and that's what you're talking about, guys with really good skills. So, Belmont put out a tweet this morning, right? The the basketball program. Grayson Murphy has won over his career three Ohio Valley Conference titles. He's been first team All League twice. He's been defensive player of the year in the league twice. He's been a mid-major All-American twice. And he's the only player in Division I over the last three years with 900 points, 600 boards, 
500 assists and 200 steals. He's probably going to end up breaking records for steals and assists uh, for, I think it's in the Ohio Valley at some point this season, assuming he has a year that we expect. So you, you were the one that, that brought him into the program, right? You were still the coach when, when he came yeah. there. What did you see from him in high school? And did you expect this kind of player when you recruited him? Well, first, the, the funny little backstory to that is that, that um, Casey Alexander recruited him really, really hard at Lipscomb and um, offered him before we did. Uh, I was a little slower on a lot of people about offering. I wanted to make sure that we had it right and that it was right for them. Uh, but uh, once I spent due diligence and, and watched him play enough to see what kind of a competitor, uh, you know, it, the only guy that can even come close to him in competitiveness really in our program over the history is Casey Alexander. And um, they uh, they just hate to lose, play like it. Uh, but but Grayson has, gosh, he has such an innate ability of talk about his rebounding. He he, he knows where the ball is going to end up. He just he has great anticipation. Uh, he he goes 100 miles an hour. No one in college basketball, I don't see anyone. It plays as hard as he does as high a percentage of the time. And uh, he's one of my very, very favorite players to coach. I, I've always wondered how, how proud are you seeing where this, this program has gone after you have left, right? We we've seen a lot of turnover with, with some big name coaches. I mean, coach K is, is retiring after the season. Roy Williams retired last season. They have guys that are replacing them and that are part of the program promoted off the coaching staff, all that kind of stuff. We don't know what John Shire is going to end up being at Duke. I'm assuming he's probably going to be pretty good. We don't know what Hubert Davis is going to do for North Carolina. I'm assuming, again, he's probably going to be pretty good. But Casey has taken over, and, and you guys haven't missed a beat. So when you see that happen, is it just – how proud are you? Is it fun to watch? Well, well, part of the answer to all that is that Casey had a lot to do with how good we were uh, for the first 15 years or so in Division One. He was there from the beginning – He's the number one assistant from the beginning. Uh, I've said before, he kind of pulled, pulled and dragged me into the Division One mentality of, of more strength and conditioning uh, training. Um, so we didn't have any summer school play early on, and now when kids started coming, uh, the, the summer recruiting efforts. Uh, but Casey's just a bright basketball mind, and, uh, and he's also um, – confident in his decisions and so he and I would have uh, would have several uh, interesting conversations shall I say about who should be playing or what kind of defense we ought to run uh, but that was all healthy so number one Casey's always been a really good coach and there was no doubt in my mind he'd be a good division one coach and then when you when you saw what he did to build Lipscomb back up and their run they made to the championship game in NIT is probably one of the one of the most sort of underreported stories in the past few years uh, from for Lipson to go from where they were to that point beating people they did on the road to get to that championship game so I am I am proud uh, but he deserves uh, the credit for making himself the coach that he is and whatever he uses and does or got from me um, great but but he was good on his own I don't know if I've ever actually asked you about Casey taking the Lipscomb job because I feel like people, people that watch it from the outside may not understand that that rivalry is it's, it's pretty intense. So you have a guy, I mean, if you're a head coach and you have an assistant on your staff, you always want them to get a head job, maybe not necessarily at the rival two miles down the road. So what, what was your, your kind of mindset when that happened and, and how hard was it, I guess, to kind of coach against it? You know, it never has been hard for me to coach against guys that I like. Some guys would rather coach against people they don't like and just get it on and, you know, but, um, but I haven't, I have, I mean, it was a little tougher because it was Lipscomb because it's such a rivalry and the Belmont fans are not going to understand that I'm okay with Casey winning the game. All right. So, um, but uh, I, 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 you know, I've always, it's been easy for me. It's, it's, it's like guys that might want to transfer. Um, somewhere I don't want them to leave uh but if they think it's the best thing for them then that's what they can do fortunately we had good retention but uh but so I, that's just kind of the way I've always felt about the guys in our 
on our staff. And and Casey's like, I don't know, he's in between a brother and a son age wise. So he's, he's a, a guy that's easy for me to pull for. So the last thing that I'll leave you with is this, um, Belmont is leaving the Ohio Valley after the season and they're heading to the Missouri Valley. In my mind, I think the next step for this program is that deep tournament run. Like you guys have done everything else. I don't know how many more conference championships you could possibly win. You've put guys in the NBA and Ian Clark and Dylan Windler. Dylan was a, a first round pick two years ago. He's playing with the Cleveland Cavaliers now. So um, I feel like that's where you take the step from being like this good mid-major that a lot of college basketball junkies know about to being that team that ends up you know, being the Florida Gulf Coast or being the uh, whoever, the, the Loyola Chicago, these teams that make the run, get into the second week and becomes that, that media darling. And, and do you have any frustration in the fact that it, it takes these kind of, I don't want to say fluky, but it takes these one-off tournament runs to really get you to the point where you become <laughs> that kind of national presence? Like, I don't know how much more Belmont can do to win. Like, you, no, I, what, I get I, it. And I, I get it, what you're saying. And I do have a little frustration <clears throat> excuse me, because I think the best measure of a program is the consistency of excellence. And, uh, and yet we've already talked about four out one in a little bit. That might not have been the best way for us to play offensively and then go up against a big seven foot two center that we couldn't score on and not have a plan B or C or D nearly as good. Uh, so I think, you know, I don't know that we were built to, to win that, uh, to win those games as easily as we were to win conference championships. Uh, but I think, I think that we were getting there. And in my last year, we, we did beat Temple to 11 seeds and we lost by one to Maryland. And I think with this move to the Missouri Valley that you're going to see um, – you're going to see them and plus the, the practice facility that Belmont just finished, which is NBA level stuff. Uh, you, they're going to get better players and Casey's a really good coach and uh, it wouldn't surprise me, but at the same time, I don't think that's, I still don't think that's the best measure and I good for Florida Gulf coast and good for Oral Roberts last year and, and Loyola Chicago kind of proved they were there um, after they made that final four run that they they had that kind of program, uh, but I'd still rather do it. The I still, I, when it's all said and done, uh, I'd still rather do it kind of the way we did the, the number of championships, uh, regular season and tournament championships in the, I don't know, last 15 years. Uh, not many people are ever going to do that. And that, that to me was, I was frustrated. I'm glad I finally won the NCAA tournament game. Yeah, well, it, it is It is kind of – I don't want to say, like, the, the luck of the draw, because that's the wrong way to kind of phrase it. But when you when when it's a one-point loss to Maryland that kind of keeps you from being that team, oh, you won two games in the tournament, right? Like, that's how fine the margins are when it comes yeah. to winning in March. And, and there's a reason why – I always say this. The NCAA tournament is the best way to determine a champion, but it is the worst way to determine who the best team is in college basketball. And I think that's what makes it so much fun because – I mean, you don't have to be in the NBA. We all know who's going to end up winning pretty much at the start of the season, right? It's going to be the best team. It's hard to beat someone in a seven game series. It's not that hard to beat somebody in a one game, uh, one game tournament game. Yeah. It, ba basketball is a tournament game and we all have to understand that. Uh, but I still think the measure of a program over a long period of time is championships. And uh, so, uh, and you guys, I hope, have, you guys I, have I, hope Belmont, days. I hope Belmont's that team, uh, soon but but you know what i think if they are that team it will be because they're that good uh, yeah. and i think they have a chance with all they got going for them right now yeah they have plenty of experience and plenty of talent on this year's roster and as yeah. you mentioned a very good coach in casey alexander yeah. rick listen i appreciate the time thank you so much thank you